So I've been here for about uh, just over two years, and uh, this is a great imaging center. And when I've been wandering around the hallways talking with people, I've frequently been asked questions such as, you can do MRI of the spinal cord? I've never seen that. Huh, that must be difficult. <clears throat> Followed by, you can do fMRI in the spinal cord? I've never heard of that. Wow, that must be really difficult. So after a couple years of hearing this and realizing that we're in an imaging center and people actually just aren't exposed to what it means to do spinal cord MRI, I thought I would share with you um, three takeaway points about spinal cord imaging. So I'm going <coughs> to probably, uh, Dr. Seuss copyright here, but uh, you know, thing number one, uh, I want to just convey a message that spinal cord MRI and fMRI is really quite challenging, and I'll, I'll get into the uh, weeds a little bit about this. So if I prepare a cartoon plot, and on the y-axis I'll say anatomy of interest in arbitrary circles, and on the x-axis field strength, I can say stuff that is easy to do is near the origin, and then as you kind of go out from this, stuff becomes more difficult. So we can respectively put brain imaging here. We do it every day, hundreds of times a day. We kind of know how to do it. And spinal cord imaging, almost by definition, is further up this axis. And it's, it's much more difficult to do. So in terms of fMRI, I'd say that about 99.8% of the studies are on the brain and associated structures, which means that still, in all the years of fMRI, there's still only about 100 papers that do fMRI and spinal cord. So think, so think about that. That's like two papers out of every thousand have something to do with the spinal cord. So this is a really, really, really small fraction. So why? First of all, the size. So a typical brain might have these sorts of dimensions, and the spinal cord is about an order of magnitude smaller than this. So if I were to overlay a typical spinal cord onto the brain, that's how big it is. So to kind of give you an idea, this is actually like on the level of, you know, kind of like the cortical ribbon. We're taking a look at very, very small structures. We're not taking a look at just you know, a part of the, you know, the cortex. We're taking a look at the entire spinal cord, and it's just, you know, that big. So we blow it up. We see that the ventral horns, which are the gray matter, are about two to three millimeters in size, and the dorsal horn is a little bit smaller, about one to three millimeters. And also, if we want to kind of think about the whole spinal cord, you know, it's a very, very long thing. Um, <clears throat> the gray matter horns, as I said, is about a millimeter. The axial size is about a centimeter, and the rostral caudal, which means up and down here, is on the order of about a meter or so. So whereas to zero order, the brain is a ball of water, we're dealing with something that looks more like a hockey stick here. And uh, this is not favorable dimensions with which to image. So the shape as well. Here's uh, some data I acquired uh, a couple of years ago at 3Tesla. And as you can see here, the subject's spinal cord was nice and straight, and we put our little box there, and we got data. It was great. The very next person I scanned, she had a cord which looks like that. Now, this is something you don't typically see in the brain. This is a structure that bends. It's very inconvenient, actually, because if you take a look at the first couple and the last few slides, they're actually not orthogonal to the spinal cord, which means you're having a different in-plane resolution as a function of slice. That's really quite annoying, especially when you're doing high-resolution imaging. You could say something like, well, can't you alter the slice profiles? And this is a theoretical <clears throat> acquisition profile where the orientation of the slices can vary from one slice to the next. Now, I proposed this about a year and a half ago, um, and uh, to my best the best of my knowledge has never actually been done. So if you're interested in this and you're like a pulse programming genius, please come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk about how something like this could be done in an automated way. This would really uh, significantly impact the field of spinal cord MRI. So as well, the location must be mentioned here. Once again, we're going back to our um, uh, whole spine. And there's a lot of stuff that creates noise and motion and other artifacts. <clears throat> So if we are interested in cervical cord imaging here, of course, we're right beside the tongue, which is actually a really big structure that moves. Um, right beside there, there's the throat. You know, you're imaging the spinal cord right there, there's the throat. You know, it, it doesn't get really any more annoying 
when someone like swallows and you have a you know one to two hundred percent signal change in your functional vision due to swallowing artifacts. You have the heart, of course, and the lungs if you're interested in thoracic um, imaging, and then of course you know all the other organs that might come into play uh, down there. And um, in addition to all of these sources of noise, you also had the cord it's surrounded by pulsating cerebral spinal fluid. So one of my collaborators said that this is one of the most like, um, what did he say? It was most uh, like toxic or challenging uh, parts of the anatomy with which to image. Now, as in addition to all of these things, I like to do spinal cord imaging at seven Tesla. Now, why do we want to do seven Tesla? Well, there's some stuff that we can do at 70 that we can't do at lower field. Now, we gotta revisit this plot. We can then say that 3T is kind of near the origin. We do it every day, 2T scanners are common. And by definition, 7T is going to be further along the axis. Now, if you're getting flashbacks of, you know, grade 5 trigonometry, you know, yes, this is a 1, 1, root 2 triangle here. Because, you know, the intersection of these two things is the domain at which we're, we're playing. So 7T spinal cord imaging is possible, but it's very challenging. But there's definitely some benefits to doing it. So first of all, we need a working scan. <laughs> and as I'm sure everyone knows, um, our scanner has um, been sick for the last 14 months, and uh, she's just coming back online. Um, and so, uh, obviously, if you don't have a scanner, you can't do any scan. So that's that's step one. So hopefully, this is now going to be a thing of the past. Um, step two: lack of readily available hardware. Now, I've talked to people in 70 groups, and they're like, "I want to do 70 imaging." And they're like, "Great, you need a spine call." They're like. Oh, 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 good point. Because if you don't have a spine coil, something that is designed and built to image the anatomy of interest, you might just, you know, go home because you can't image the <laughs> anatomy of interest. Bless you. So this was a, uh, about a year ago. I did a survey of all the 70 spinal cord abstracts and papers in the world. And uh, they're actually here in this review article. And as for about a year ago, these are all the coils in the world for um, spinal cord and as you can see here, there's about you know five or, or six that do cervical imaging, which is the most common. So if you think about this, all the coils in the world, you can fit on one very uncluttered slide. This shows that there are you know very, very few coils with which to image the anatomy. There's actually really no vendor that like outwardly promotes um, building and selling of these coils. If you talk with them, they might do that for you. But um, in general, it's actually really quite hard to design and build a coil. But, you know, the one that we have here in Bay 5 is this one right here, uh, built by uh, Larry Wallace Lab. And finally, you know, I won't uh, belabor this too much, but there's also big difficulties with main field V-naught shimming. So here's actually a functional image of the cord uh, from one of the first images that I acquired in, back in January of uh, 2012. See here, this is about, uh, you know, C4, so uh, looks pretty nice. And then if you take a look further down in regions that were not shimmed properly because the cord bends and the gradient sets are, are linear for the shims, you actually see something here which has a very not high noise to contrast ratio. I mean, it's complete rubbish. So these are the things that you don't see in the brain at all, and this is common in the spinal cord when the imaging parameters are unfavorable. So these are the things that you know, we have to deal with. Additionally, even if you're imaging the cord, an area that can be shimmed really good, there's even, you know, due to whatever reasons, I can get to, you know, over a beer later, um, you can actually have sporadic bad shakes for no particular reason. So this was actually the first functional run. As you can see, it's complete rubbish due to very poor shims. And then the very next run, is just gorgeous. So this is even like run-to-run -run variability, which if you're trying to do a reproducibility study, is really not going to be helping you get good data. So these are, you know, once again, some of the many issues that you typically don't see in the brain, but it's common in 70s spinal cord imaging. Now, just wrapping it up, the last two things are pretty quick here. Um, thing number two is that I'd like to say that um, although there are many, many difficulties, and I could talk for over an hour about the challenges, um, this is important. This is important. Now, I'm um, <clears throat> just going to take a sip of water here. I would like to have some audience participation at this point. So some people, when I talk with them, they say, oh, what's the spinal cord useful for? That would be like reviewer two on my, you know, um, one of my grant applications. <laughs> so um, I would just like to kind of point out some of the things that the spinal cord might be impacted by. 
So I would like audience participation. If you know of someone, either personally, in your family, or yourself, um, are aware of anyone with a particular condition, please raise your hand and keep it up. So anyone that knows or has had a spinal cord injury. All right, big, big high, all the way up, okay, good. Multiple sclerosis. <coughs> ALS. Transverse myelitis. Chronic pain. Oh yeah, there's a few more people, okay. Fibromyalgia. Okay. Spinal cord tumor. So a lot of people like just not raising their hands. I don't believe me. And for those people, anyone just know what normal anything is? <laughs> right? Right, right. So basically, pretty much 100% of people, including normal <coughs> aging, which is a process of the spinal cord, because it's part of the central nervous system, is affected by um, something that might be um, a disease of the spinal cord. So it's really not something that we can just neglect and continue focusing on the brain. It turns out that the spinal cord is connected to the brain. It is more neglected than the cerebellum, which really said something. And um, I think it is something that is, is warranted to, to study more of. And finally, thing number three is that we've basically seen the intersection of very significant technical challenges and the scientific needs. There are clinical symptomologies that involve the spinal cord. And in the clinic, people talk about a clinical radiological paradox, meaning that you, know, you go see a clinician, they're characterizing your disease in this way, but then you do MRI, and the findings really aren't consistent quite often. And people believe that that's because you're focusing on quite often the brain and what the brain is doing. And there's a lot to be said for perhaps the spinal cord has a big chunk of the disease burden, but we just don't know much about that because we're not looking down there all the time. Or if we're looking, we're not doing looking at 7 Tesla, which has the advantages of higher spatial resolution and better contrast. An example of this is a paper that came out of uh, the Wald Lab a couple years ago after they built their coil. And you can very clearly see the benefits of higher fields and higher resolutions to, to visualize the anatomy of the spinal cord, higher conspicuity of these very small structures. And um, you can really see that, you know, this is better than this, especially if you want to diagnose a disease. You don't need to know anything about the spinal cord to know that right is better than left in this picture. Similarly, some of the work that I've been doing for the last four or five years <coughs> is you can actually start to do functional imaging in the spinal cord. And I won't get into any of the details, but it turns out that we've actually recently showed that these functional signatures are altered in patients with uh, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And this is the first evidence that these networks actually change in the spinal cord just like they change in the brain as a result of disease. This now opens the avenue for not only looking at brain changes in function and disease, but also the spinal cord as well. This is another piece of the puzzle, which is still incomplete. And my last slide, I took this picture at the uh, building of the Seaport last year that we had our, um, uh, our uh, retreat in for the Free Surfer. Um, I thought it was kind of cool. Innovation is for everyone. And I was looking for some slides when I was preparing this and I came across this. And I really think this says something because personally, I got involved in spinal cord imaging basically um, after a bottle of wine on a Friday night. And I was talking to a colleague and he kind of dared me to, to take a look at spinal cord imaging, and the rest is history. So I didn't know anything, and here I am a few years later still talking about it. So if you're sitting there in the audience and if you have great ideas, I know there's machine learning people out there, um, you know, if, you're, if you're interested in pulse sequence programming and you're looking for a challenging application, if you're interested in denoising strategies, if you're interested in stuff that may not involve the spinal cord, but in this talk you've seen some opportunities or some Areas where my interest might intersect with your interest, this is an opportunity for innovation. And I definitely encourage everyone to come chat afterwards and see how we can collaborate to push this field forward. So with that, I'd just like to summarize with my three takeaway messages and acknowledge my funding opportunities that keeps me employed. Thank you for that. <laughs>